It was just like a circus. <laughs> Merton used to come say she didn't ever know when she came home who would be asleep on the couch. <laughs> but when was that? Oh, like, that was, that was when, we were going, when we were still in school. And Cleo was, uh, had a boyfriend that was in the in Army? Or was that Dale? All, well, anyway, all they all had boyfriends because they were all a service. Denver was a big, big base. Uh, Air Force Base there, and, and they had so an Army base there too. That's why there was never any apartments or houses mm -hmm. to rent. You know, you couldn't find anything. There were uh, two stories somebody brought up yesterday that I uh, needed to ask you about. Something about a transvestite. Somebody. <laughs> Billy Phil. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't, but he was as cute as a bug. What was that? He was the cutest little kid. He was uh, a little bit stout. Built, well, and he was strong though. You know, he was stout. and he was just one of the bunch. But I don't know. He got this model A Models, model T. Model T. Was this in Denver? Or? Yeah, it was in Denver, and it was while we were still in school. And he and these five or six guys would run around all over creation in this model mm -hmm. T. Model T. When we had the gas. When they had the gas. Right. But if they were going anywhere and they ran out of gas. They had a kerchief and whatever they put under for boobs. Uh, Don't know what that art was. Artificial apples and oranges <laughs> and wax. Mm -hmm. So they'd slip them under Billy's t shirt and tie a string around and hold them up in place. Yeah. He'd roll his pant legs up, put that bandana on, and get out there and push, push. on the back of that car. And then <laughs> People come by and give him a push. He jumped in legs. <laughs> he had a rumble seat. He had curly hair, and he was just pretty. That's oh, all. He was just a good-looking kid. Good-looking young guy. Funny. Well, some people would give him gas, or no? Well, they, they would give him pushes. Give him pushes. They you were pushed all go over Denver. <laughs> station. You're gonna need a push to the station. Oh, well, they well, push and steer, and somebody yeah, push. Yeah, yeah. They push. Go on, and we'd get somebody else pushed. <laughs> <laughs> so they got pushed all over Denver. <laughs> well, well, we'd most certainly get pushed to home eventually. Funny. Oh, God, it was funny. Yeah, he, he was a funny little guy. Nice guy. <laughs> he, he, he was pretty. He was so cute. It's pretty inventive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they were a Duke's mixture of kids. They were tall and skinny and short and stocky. Al Brungard was just built like an ape. Uh -huh. yeah, and he, he was. And these were all your buddies? All his out? buddies. And those are the bunch I kicked out of the theater. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> They were pretty smart, they thought. That's funny. <laughs> but it was funny because it was it was a riot. Everybody just hee hawed about that car and these kids going around town mm -hmm. without gas. Mm -hmm. It was pretty funny. Well, we'd, we'd go clear to brush, <laughs> 90 miles to brush. And we'd pull With our no money gas? and go to brush. And we'd, we'd pay our guys, you know, get our gas going back and forth. But we'd go down to brush and hang around brush and then come back. It was quite right. It was fun. I mean, I never wrote in it, but I. <laughs> I would have been murdered Sounds like in my an sleep. adventure. Yeah. yeah. I never did write in it. No, no I didn't. <laughs> so, what uh, What did you guys. What did like holidays look like? Where would you go and who would you see on, on Christmas and Thanksgiving? And well, Mom always cooked and Mert cooked. Yeah, so Mom would have. We would. Uh, Thanksgiving dinner, you know, mm -hmm. wasn't always turkey, but she'd have a ham or a big, used to be able to buy capons. Mm -hmm. They were great big chickens. Sure. And, chicken. uh, she'd cook maybe two of them and, and uh, or a ham or something for Christmas and, and Thanksgiving. But we, had, uh, we would go from one to the other, and then after yeah. we got our kids that were little, they would come to our house. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, her and her mother would. Mom could cook something out of an old shoe. <laughs> I never saw the light. I mean, I can appreciate it now. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, knowing supplies were limited and so on, she could just get in the kitchen and in a little while have a meal. Where do you think she picked that up? Uh, I think she did it because she did it. 
She was eight years old when they came from Texas to Colorado, mm -hmm. and they came by wagon. And she said that she was the one that always made the biscuits mm -hmm. over the fire, you know. Mm -hmm. Eight years old, that's pretty young. Yeah. So I think that she was probably just well, adept at picking up something. Well, made her do learn how to cook. You know, well, my her. grandmother broke horses in a side saddle, yeah, you know. Before she was married. Before, well, whenever it was, mm -hmm. it was tough. And she did a man's work. A lot of times the women did men's work sure. right alongside the men, and so the kids did the house. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably how she really. She picked it up. But because she never measured anything, I mean, I can still make her pie crust, mm -hmm. but it's not a measure. You just scoop out the flour and dump in some salt, you know, and you stir it all up, and it's pie crust. Right. But mm -hmm. she was just an excellent cook. You know, made baked pies. And cakes and just the whole thing and I wish I had learned a lot more from it. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is like going way off track but what do you know about where our families came from or immigrated immigrated from? hmm I don't remember my on my mother's side her father was Irish her maiden name was Odell, mm -hmm. and on my father's side, I was told, his name is Thompson, uh, English mm -hmm. and Irish, a little bit of French, and somewhere I was told there was some Scotch in it. Hmm. So whether it was my mother's father that was uh, Irish and English, or what, I'm not quite sure, but I know that Thompson is a is a basic English name, mm -hmm. and Odell is an Irish name. And I knew my mother always said that my grandfather was Irish, mm -hmm. more than anything else. She didn't really say any other. But when my grandmother and my grandmother was born in uh, Comanche, Texas, mm -hmm. so she was married to my grandfather, and then they moved into the Brownsville area which is at mm -hmm. the Almogorda Bay there. Right. Right. And that's where they had five of the children. And that's where they left from to go to Colorado. Hmm. So that's about as far back as I can go with either one of them. Yeah. And my dad came from Illinois. He was born in McLeansboro, Illinois. And uh, I know he was the English and part French. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's about all I know about him. Yeah. I don't know. Period. I, I knew his sisters. I knew two of his sisters. And but I and I knew his his mother, my grandmother Bowers, but uh, didn't know anything about her. Mm -hmm. You know. Right. Well, when you really got acquainted with her, she was real senile. Yeah, she was in the last stages of being oh, Alzheimer's. Okay. And they didn't know it then, but you know, when Doc and I got married, actually, she was up at the house in in Cala Mesa, and uh, she was just a she was a big boned woman. Grandma was, mm -hmm. you know, kind of. I, I'm trying to relate mm -hmm. to what she looked like, just one of the old prairie ladies, you know. Yeah. And a little bit stooped over, and and uh, she always wore a kerchief. And she, <laughs> we put a sewing machine or something across an alcove doorway for Doc because he was sleeping in the living room before we got married. And she'd stand at that doorway and she'd lean on that and she'd look at him <laughs> and she'd say, God Almighty, there's a man. <laughs> God Almighty, God Almighty, there's a man. <laughs> she didn't know much about that. But, you know. What are you doing? I thought you had had to go. I do. You do. I bought this for you. Yeah, I found it. I'll use it up for a while. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Where'd you buy it? Target. Oh, Target. Mm -hmm. I think that's that stuff. Yeah. It might be. Matt oh. gave him a couple little samples. Pads. 
But this here is like a roll on. Mm -hmm. It's a pot. I don't know what's in the point. jar. The other jar. But anyway, I don't know where Cope's folks came. They, I remember they were in uh, Indiana. Mm -hmm. That's the far back as I can remember. You know, yeah. anybody saying. He used to talk about his uh, his was it his grandmother when they were coming off the ship from overseas. Mm -hmm. She she was being carried by an aunt, and uh, some way she dropped her into the bay or into the, the ocean. Ocean where they were the off the ship. Yeah. Gosh. And that would that's be a all shock. In, Wow. And as I recall, they came from either Germany or Holland. Really? The Copeland, Copeland? side of the family. Hmm. And, uh, I thought we researched Copeland once, and it was, uh, what did we look it up in one of those? Uh, Dana? When we were in Europe and we looked up Copeland, what was the... Origin. What was the origin of it? Remember when we went to that one castle? It Rose? sounds German. Copeland? Now, Copeland, you know, yeah. and Copeland. Well, the Dutchmen out here, the, the dairymen. Copeland, they call us. They, uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Do you remember, Dana? Copeland, that's a good name. <laughs> 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 so I don't know what it was. And then on my uh, mom's side, her dad was adopted. And uh, then where he came from, you know. But her mother, uh, they, were, they were English. And they came, her ancestors came from England. Her name was uh, Thatcher, hmm. which is a very English name. Very. And uh, they settled in Missouri. They came into Missouri. Hmm. And as she <laughs> tells how her mother rode with the Jesse James boys, the James boys. Well, she did. But it was before they became outlaws. They were, they were neighbors. Neighbors, you know. Could, this is your grandmother. Yeah, my my grandmother used to say her mother. Her so mother. Great, great great grandmother. Great grandmother great. rode with Jesse J. Yeah. But <laughs> Frank. Isn't that funny? She, Poor Jesse and Frank were. Yeah, that was when they was kids on a yeah. farm, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but she jokingly say, "Yeah, my mother rode with the James boys." <laughs> Cool. Yeah. And people look at her. <laughs> she enjoyed it. <laughs> she was a kind of she was a well she she ruled the roost the, the Smith the family. She and there was how many? Well there was nine. Ten. Ten. Six boys and four girls and Yikes. And, uh, <laughs> one time my granddad he he fell off a hay wagon one time and broke his hip. Mm -hmm. And of course then they couldn't do anything about broken hips, they right. just broke. And then one leg was quite a bit shorter than the other one. And mm -hmm. When I was a little bitty kid, he was on crutches mm -hmm. all the time. And then he got to where he had a crutch, crutch, a crutch and a cane. And then he finally just come up with a cane. Mm -hmm. And he would, but he, he worked, held down a job and, and everything. They homesteaded up south of Brush, but the things got tough and mm -hmm. he had a, he owed a, I think it was an $80 grocery bill at a, at a grocery store in town. Mm -hmm. And he, he couldn't stand to owe anybody. Mm -hmm. So he sold my grandmother's homestead oh. to pay the 80 yeah, bucks. $80 bill. Wow. And then he sold his later, but his wasn't near as good a home. Hers was on a creek. Oh. It was just an ideal, you know. You oh. Give your eye teeth for it now, but oh yeah. But he, I think, I think it was about Boy. eighty bucks that he owed, and he. That's just incredible. You know, give it to him. And That's he was a funny old man. He he did just didn't owe anybody. He didn't want to owe anybody. Right. But tell the story to Clayton and Mary about. That one day. The garden. <laughs> yeah, one day, and when he kind of semi-retired, mm -hmm. why he came to into town, he worked out for farms and he'd drive horses and, and do everything just like he, anybody. He could do anything with a team of horses that anybody could do. And uh, one day, why, Grandma, 
I don't know what it was about, but boy, she had ate him out something terrible. Boy, she just raised hell with him. <laughs> and I always thought he was the greatest thing around. And I was always right behind him. And he'd come out the house, and he took two or three steps, and he turned around and he says, Young man, if anybody ever tells you he's boss of his house, you want to watch him, because he'll lie to you again someday. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> about three. <laughs> And Mert took care of him too yeah. before he died yeah. Mom, in she Denver. Took him when none of the other kids would take him. Mm -hmm. You know, they they tried. Each one of them tried. Ernie tried more than any of them, but the others tried to kind of take care of him, and they right. they couldn't get along. You know, and so well, their wives mostly. But so he come to Denver and stayed there with Mom. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dad, he was off working somewhere else most of the time. He was, he, uh, when they built the uh, the nuclear plant in Tennessee, oh, boy, Tennessee he, Valley he, Authority. He was down there on a construction crew when they built it. Wow. Uh, that was it like was either mid thirties, right? Uh, no, oh, it was in the the well, just just the war started in the uh, 42, 41, 42. 42. Okay. And he stayed down there till that was complete. And then he come back home and he worked in just construction around. They had a, a what they called the Rocky Mountain Arsenal, and they were building an arsenal plant out there. And, mm -hmm. and he worked on construction out there. And then he got the book to be in a sheep herder, sheep mm -hmm. shearer. Mm -hmm. And he he went with a guy. What the hell was that guy? I forget. But he went with him. But he wasn't strong enough to shear sheep, and so they put him to stomp and wool. He's, the wool sack is as long as that couch and just about that big around. Mm -hmm. And they'd hang him up in these cradles deals. And then when they sheared the sheep, well, they'd throw them pelts up there and cope would stomp them in. They had to be stomped, just they couldn't. Because if you stomp too much, you'd split the sack. Oh. And if you didn't stomp them enough, then they wasn't heavy enough, so he got the job of doing that, and he did that for several years. Oh, and they stumped. Yeah, oh, it was a bad job, away, hard you know. job, hard job. But he would uh, go to Wyoming during shearing season and work up there. Then he'd come back in the wintertime and work on a construction job or something. You know. hmm. He wasn't home much of the time when we was living there in Denver. Mm -hmm. Somebody around. You know it. My granddad, Odell, was deputy sheriff in Boulder, Colorado. Really? Mm -hmm. Chris has a picture of him. I thought you had it in here. I have. I don't know that I have it in here, but I have one. But I, and I don't. I never knew him because he died of cancer before I right. was old enough to know him. But um, he did. He had done well, you know, mm -hmm. coming up from. Texas and what all, and I don't know what all he did before that. Well, they were farmers in Texas. Well, well yeah. I know they were why, in Texas. They, why did they move from Texas to Colorado? You know? Panhandle of Texas is a pretty bleak place. Yeah. You were they were in the Panhandle. They were no? in at Alamogordo Bay. Yeah, but that's down the bottom of Texas. Well, they were at the bottom, wherever they were. I said Panhandle. Panhandle is up in Amarillo? The, the Colorado, Oklahoma. Amarillo. Yeah. Okay. Amarillo. Well, then, no, they were at the Alamogordo Bay because uh -huh. they were at Brownsville. Brownsville and, and Brownsville. Right at the, on the Gulf of Mexico. Right. right. And right I guess the tip of Texas. they just didn't have anything to do. Right. Well, you know, the, the farms was were bad. I don't know why they moved. But they um, were farmers by trade? They were. They would have had to have been, yeah, yeah farmers. Broke, I, I don't know if they still had any horses or not. Well, they had to have horses to come across the uncovered. Well, they had, wagon. yeah, but I mean horses that they would sell or something oh, like that. I don't really know. What year do you think they made that move? Well, mother was era? mother was eight, and she was born in 1899. Oh, so early. So yeah, it was early. Uh, I have a picture. 1899. Mother was born in 1899. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay. Um, 
and they had... God, did her parents fight the Civil War or anything like that? I mean, that's, you know, I don't that's know. that generation. I don't know, because I know that Mother was next to youngest, yeah. and I know the two older boys, Frank and Jim, split off from them when they were nearing Colorado, and right. the two older boys... Oh, the ones that never... And Mother never did know what happened to those boys at all. Oh, and communication was, no, you know, nothing. Her brothers. Her brothers. Right. Two of her brothers. I'm going to have to get a flow chart of all the names. I know. Well, you know, our tree doesn't go back very far. <laughs> yeah, we didn't, you know, there wasn't... too many names, and I'm confused. <laughs> there, wasn't, there wasn't the knowledge of family trees then because, sure. number one, the communications weren't there. People wow. moved around a lot in the United States, especially. Now, if you were in Europe, that was a different story. Plus, you were sort of well, concerned so. with, like, trying to get Stay food alive. and <laughs> keep a job yeah. and all that. Yeah. But I have this one picture of my grandmother and their family, not with my mother, because she wasn't born yet, and that was in mm -hmm. 1864. Mm -hmm. And my, my grandmother was very thin, as was my grandfather. He was very tall and thin anyway. But the children, the boys, didn't have any shoes on. You could tell that they were just poor people. Mm -hmm. And then I have another picture later, and I can't remember just exactly, but Mother was in it, and she was probably six or eight, maybe even nine. Mm -hmm. And she had on a new pair of patent leather shoes. And she was on a white rug. And she said she was mad because she didn't want to stand on the rug. So she was kind of pouty looking in this picture. <laughs> but the long, nearly to the ankle dress with a wide sash, typical of Victorian. that era. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a staff, just a curved, like a shepherd's staff. Right. You know, they posed them like that. Well, that's like, yeah, it was just yeah. prime Victorian Exactly. Era. And then I have a picture of the family with mother in it. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the children all had shoes on. My grandfather had on a tie. My grandmother had a, what looked to be a nice dress. So from 1894, and I can't remember when this other picture was made, you could see the changes that had occurred in right. their status right. for whatever reason. I don't know what the occupations were or anything, but you can certainly see in those two pictures the before and afters. Mm -hmm. So he wound up as a deputy sheriff in Golden. You guys were like in your teens when World War II broke out, right? Um, mm -hmm. A little younger? You were, what, 15? 41, so I would have been... Uh, you early. were 11. No. You were born in... No, you were 13. 30, 40. I mean, 12. 38, 39, 12 40, 13. 12 13. 41. I was Probably 13. Do you yeah. remember much, I mean, about what the mood was like and Just what your friends and family were doing at that time? I had a pen pal who was a friend of my mother's son, and he wrote me from the service, and he sent me patches. I wish I had them. When I came to California, I left him home, and I have no idea what happened to him. But anywhere he went, he got patches, kind of like Chris saves mm -hmm. patches from the sheriff's well, department. military patches. Right. And he sent me, I probably had 500. Mm -hmm. And they were gorgeous, because anywhere he'd go, he would get patches from the others. And he wrote, and he was, um, his letters, I suppose I was 14. So he was at least 18 or 19. And his letters reminded me of the things that you saw in the Band of Brothers series. Mm -hmm how hard it was, how cold it was, how right. they were miserable. They had no food and no ammunition and things like that. And um, we always heard on the radio how of the bombings and of mm -hmm. the blackouts and of you know people during war work. And in junior high, the one thing I remembered is that they made us draw in art. We drew legs. Now, ladies' legs are not easy to draw, like silk stockings. All right. Yeah, because you couldn't get silk stockings. Oh. They, you had, you oh, you had drew them on your makeup legs. on your gotcha. legs. Right. Stuff. But why we had to draw these legs in art class, I don't quite remember. 
But it was hard for me to draw legs. <laughs> sending them to the trips from around, maybe? I don't know. I can't, I can't even correlate it. Did, it was because of the war. Did, did you remember, like, the men going out to fight? And I don't know much about what Denver's contribution was to the war effort, but were women working in the factories more? Yeah, or? absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had Gates Rubber Company build a lot of tires and a lot of fan belts and rubber products to go on. Uh, military Army trucks and so forth, and they had a uh, Remington, the Remington munitions plant was there, and a lot of the women worked at the Remington munitions plant. A lot of them worked at Gates, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, what else was it? Was there that they? I can't remember now. It's been a long time. Mm -hmm. Did you guys? I mean, have to collect things for to donate to the war effort or do any, I mean, you were too young to work, but yeah, really. But. I think the schools collected, uh, yeah. the schools collected like the sometimes they do now, you know, put up a sign and say, for whatever shelter around mm -hmm. or whatever cause, the schools collected stuff. And I know we'd bring in pennies. Yeah. I know we did a pennies thing. Really? And uh, it was a lot of pennies. This was at this was at junior high. This wasn't in elementary school. Oh. Baker. Hmm. What about rationing? Did you have to ration? Oh yeah. Yeah, everything was rationed. Meat was rationed. Sugar. Sugar, about anything. A lot of things were rationed, you know. You had a coupon book. You had gas was rationed. Oh, yeah. Well, we didn't have cars, so we didn't well, have to worry about gas. Cars, yeah. but uh, yeah. shoes you'd have. Uh, Two stamp, two shoe stamps a year. And that's you, that's all shoes you have, unless you con somebody out of a shoe stamp, right. you know, and different things like that. They, uh, but it it was. Well, I don't remember ever doing without anything during the war. Mm -hmm. You know, we had clothes and shoes and, and so forth. Sometimes, boy. Somebody would wear a pair of shoes longer than somebody else, and so the family would would give. Well, they trade shoes. To, well, and then they trade shoes up the kids too. Mm -hmm. yeah, you well, know, you didn't really wear them out like Jeffrey. She outgrows things. Right. Outgrow them, well, and then they'd give them to somebody else. <laughs> and they'd, but they, they had red food stamps. Oh, all colors. What they meant, different things and different amounts. Mm -hmm. yeah, mother worked for a bakery, well, for Continental Baking, which is Hostess. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was later, though, when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. But she sewed for the WPA during okay. the war. And uh, it was just a huge place, mm -hmm. all full of sewing machines, and all the women sewed. Mm -hmm. They made pants and shirts. Mm -hmm for, you know, everybody, mm -hmm. and then the government would take them and they'd give them to people who needed them. Mert worked as, in a sewing machine place, and then she got in to, uh, the government started taking over the cafeterias in school, mm -hmm. and she became the head cafeteria woman, and she had four... In Brush, was that yeah. in Brush? She had four or five women that <laughs> she worked too, but she was basically the supervisor. Mm -hmm. And she worked there until, well, until we moved to Denver. And then she went to work for Gates Rubber Company. Hmm. But, but they all did their thing. I mean, our mothers never quit trying, regardless mm -hmm. of what it was. Right. And mother started out when she was younger, like 18, and she taught piano. And that was in Albuquerque. And it just kept going from there. Non-stop. Non-stop. You want to take a break for a little while? And take a bathroom break? And might we do it for a little while longer? No, okay. go ahead. Ugh. Gonna know all of our secrets, Mary. Yeah. <laughs> you can blackmail us. <laughs> Have the disc. Have the disc. Uh, all the secrets. All the secrets.
Uh, or, uh, Grandma was telling us about your dad was a pretty good square dance caller. Yeah, he was one of the best. You know, he, he could call square dance. He'd get up there and call and do all kinds of little gimmicks and dances and <coughs> so forth. Wiggle his legs. Yeah, I still don't know, how he, don't know how he did that. I don't know. It was like he was on a vibrating machine. <laughs> <laughs> he, he would be up Well, they'd, they'd have him come for miles to call square dances. Really? <laughs> uh, he used to get paid some for it, but then days they, nobody had any money, but they, they would pay him a little to come call. <laughs> and we, when we was kids, we'd go somewhere. We never had a car. I don't remember how the hell we ever got there, but, <laughs> but you had somebody to. would would haul us, and, and mo most of the time, part of the time anyway, they'd, they'd take take us with them. And, uh, and other times, where they just the uh, folks would go. Yeah, um, they had to have a night out. Well, when <laughs> Cleo kind of got old enough to be kind of you know then 11, 12 years old. Well, she was kind of babysitter. Plenty old mm -hmm. enough in those days. Uh, then, then they went more without us than before. But. It's good to know there's somebody in my yeah. history that has musical aptitude and rhythm. <laughs> yeah. It took rhythm. Well, did he play the harmonica some? My grandmother Odell played harmonica uh, too. One. Yeah. You know, I can remember him playing the harmonica, and I don't know why I ever quit, mm -hmm. but he did, and he he played in the, it was American Legion, and he played uh, in the American Legion Drum and Bugle Corps. He played played the bass drum. Boom, boom. Just <laughs> <laughs> as big as he was. <laughs> yeah, hey, but he played the bass drum in that for, for a time. I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. The rest of us were ever very musically inclined. <laughs> um, my mother's family, and I don't know of any of Cope's families that played anything, you know. Hmm. I know my mom was a piano teacher, my sister played She's the violin and the guitar, wow. and I sang, and we... <laughs> We went to Denver, and Debbie was, was she 13? No, I think so. She was 13, I believe. 12 or 13. And we, and we just talked on the way to and from, you know, how you do when you're traveling. Uh-huh. So we went down on Larmer Street, which was like... Pawn shops. Pawn shop row in Denver mm -hmm. while we were there, and we bought her a second-hand guitar. Mm -hmm. And she picked at it all the way home. Mm -hmm. That's what started her out, picking. Mm -hmm. So she just picked it. She picked it up. She'd listen to records and well, radio. She'd watch and, people. She and said they had the what they call the town hall party on on television. Television, and mm -hmm. she'd sit and watch them guitar players. You know, <laughs> and that's why she's played right-handed. She, yeah, well, them guys were right-handed, so she tried to copy what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one of the way, ways she got started. Yeah. And then. Uh, Jimmy Midgley with it. Mm -hmm. Well, we're when they were in high school, yeah. yeah. But that's about as far as the music goes. Uh, my grandmother sang, but all the people sang then because they sang hymns. Yeah, well, I even sang. I know you do. You do good. Too. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't know about my grandfather. I have no idea. Hmm. My dad didn't have any musical ability that I know of. Yeah. So. No. <laughs> uh, anybody ever get in trouble with the law? No, somebody I know once. Really? I don't know what was his name. <laughs> <laughs> My dad was uh, arrested for possession of uh, beer <laughs> when during probation days, and he was he was making homebrew. But yeah. and I don't know that he, I don't know whether he was selling it or not, uh -huh. but he, uh, some federals came, you know, and 
he'd give them some beer. So they promptly arrested him. Uh, they were <laughs> undercover? I guess. You know, mm. he, he didn't know there's Federals anyway. And they took him up to the to the jail in Fort Morgan and we had a friend there in, in Brush called Doc Lamb. And, and he was uh, in the American Legion. He was, a, I don't know what he was, but he was, so he came up in and, the little town. And I don't know whether he went bail for that or not, but he got out. And it's a, nothing was ever done about it, because right. he never he never collected for it. He just had it. Mm -hmm. They got him for possession, was all. Mm. And, uh, I was know, thinking I think, a little bit closer to the tree. I, I think he was <laughs> a little bit closer. Probably maybe in there four or five days, maybe a week. Oh, yeah. well, that was a but, long time. Yeah. No, for making, for, making brew, for making homebrew and brush, Colorado, huh? In brush. For making homebrew and brush, Yeah. Well, he made homebrew. Wherever he was. When he right. was kids, we always had a, even after probation mm -hmm. was over, mm -hmm. why we had homebrew, he'd make homebrew right. all the time. He had bottles of homebrew wow. in the basement and uh, wherever we were. What a rebel. Now, now tell them about your story. Well, oh, you forget that story, story <laughs> don't you? This is one he wouldn't tell. On my 18th birthday. He wouldn't tell me, was, though. We were, I was in Denver. Married a year, right? No, we weren't married Oh, not yet. married No, no, no. He wouldn't tell me either. It was my, on my 18th birthday. That's oh. where we was married. <laughs> um, Harry Gillen, Tommy Thompson, Kelly, my uncle, and I, we got to drink a little beer, you know, and celebrate my birthday. Mm -hmm. Fun. And Harry had this old 34 Chevy four-door <laughs> car. And we had been hitting the little bars who would sell us beer, you know, because so, Harry, I don't think, was 18, and he had to be 21 to buy beer in, in Denver at that mm -hmm. time. And the only one that was 21 was Kelly. And the uncle. rest of us was 17 mm -hmm. and so on. <laughs> 18 and so we come and we was getting we knew we was getting pretty drunk so we decided we'd get us something to eat and go home you know mm -hmm. it was all it was all partied out and it was wee hours in the morning and Harry started to pull in this little drive-in restaurant where they had belt the car hops to mm -hmm. come out and take get your food and this old car stalled out right there in the driveway <laughs> And always as they sat down there and I was in the back seat laying there all soused up and <laughs> this highway patrolman come up and he wanted to know and Kelly he started telling him how he'd just met these boys and, and they'd been drinking a little bit and, and uh, he was going to take them home and he was going to take them home and, and mm -hmm. make sure they didn't get in any trouble and everything and this cop he said all right, well, Smith, how, how sober are you? Well, I'm sober. Yeah, I'm sober. He says, well, stand up. So he stood up with his feet way apart, stood up, held on to the car. <laughs> and the cop says, turn loose that car. So he turned loose the car and was down there kind of wobbling a little bit. The cop said, put your feet together. Put his feet together and he fell over and caught this cop right on the neck and he said, uh, I knew he was in trouble. And I knew all I had to do, because all the doors was open, there was a pile of bushes over there just coming out. And I knew if I could get up and crawl ten bushes, he'd never know I was there. But I couldn't get he up and crawl ten bushes. <laughs> so we, we went to the Golden Jail. Uh, we, we spent the night in, in jail. And Harry Gillen, he was a nervous little guy. He was all so worried about his car, what they was going to do to his car, and all oh, his dad was going to kill him, and all that. Uh -huh. And he just walked the floor all the damn time we was in there. He sobered up, didn't he? Uh, yeah, he, he, sobered pretty quick. he got sober real quick when we got uh -huh. to jail. So, and the next morning, my, this sheriff, deputy sheriff, or whatever he was, he come in and, and he told us young guys, we could go. And I said, well, what about Kelly? I said, can he go? No, no, because he's the only one of age, and he's going to be responsible. Oh, So we 
I said, well, I'll, let me talk to him a little bit. And Kelly said, don't tell me where he had his money hid at, <laughs> at, at an apartment. At an apartment. Him, who was he? Him and Harry was living in it, I guess. Yeah, And uh, He told me where he had his money hid, and he had a, a diamond ring that he'd bought some old gal, and he said he'd take out and hawk it. And <laughs> so we help. went over and gathered up all this stuff, and of course I went and told Mom what had happened, and mm. oh, she was all upset about it. Mm. So we we went up there that night to, uh, you know, see what they were going to do with him. Mm -hmm. And we got up there, and the, the sheriff was an old guy that was, we kind of knew just, well, it was 27 miles from where we lived there in Brust, where he lived, and he was an old cowboy. And we, boy, we rode bucking horses around that room, man. <laughs> Told a lot of stories. We time about our long bucking horse days, and, yeah. and pretty quick he said, well, get the hell out. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, he didn't have to say it twice. We jumped up and left and come out of there kind of in a hurry. And Mom was waiting out in the waiting room outside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she said, what happened? What happened? And Kelly says, come on, we escaped. <laughs> 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 and she said, well, let's hurry. <laughs> She's driving the getaway car. Right? <laughs> uh, that's great. But we had all of Kelly's money and his diamond ring and everything. <laughs> We, we was going to bail him out, we didn't have to. That's great. We just, the old boy, and I can't remember his name, but he was from Akron, and we was from Brush, mm -hmm. and we knew all the people he knew, we knew, right. and I'd never ever remembered meeting him. Kelly said he met him one time, but we started talking about people, you know, he, <laughs> oh, he yeah. knew the name of Smith, is right. what it did, and he stayed at, and then we got talking about Bill Larry, and Foots lures and some of the guys that we knew, you know, mm -hmm. and then, but he he was a cowboy. He wanted to <laughs> let him go. God but damn, the funny well, thing is, great. he drove he rode the bus all the way to California, right? Mm -hmm. And he kept saying he has something to tell me, and he and he wouldn't tell me what it was. <laughs> and and well, I, but I he, went back to my home. I wrote you a time or two. But yeah, but he kept saying, you know, he had something to tell me, but he wasn't going to tell me until after we got married. Mm. And <laughs> really? Finally, after we got married, and he told me he'd spent the night in jail, he thought I wouldn't marry him because he'd spent the night in jail. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what he had to tell me. <laughs> Infamous trip. What did you think about the story when you heard it? Well, I thought I could break Kelly's neck. <laughs> He knew better. And Kelly was how much older than you? Like, well, he's eighty, and I'm seventy, seventy-four. Okay, so that's five 81. or six years. He's uh, seven years older. Than okay. Me. But he'd been in the service, and he was a man about town, sure. you know, <laughs> and a dandy. Oh, he was the handsome man, mm -hmm. you know. Good-looking kid. You know. And nice, but ordinary. Very. <laughs> yeah, he was ordinary. We, you know, but we were was near the same age, and um, where he lived with his brothers in the summertime, I would go out there and, and stay with him, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, we used to get in some hellacious troubles out there. Oh, yeah. too. We uh, we wasn't supposed to ride any of them cows or calves or anything, you know, around there. They were working, or huh? They were working. They were working. In the field, okay. Um, we were supposed to be taking care of what they call the out cattle. Mm -hmm. um, we'd go out and ride through the out cattle and make sure they was all right, make sure they had water and right. the grass wasn't getting too short and so forth. Right. And we never once wanted to get a rope on one. And, no, we uh, that and, and <laughs> we'd get them on and he, mm -hmm. Kelly'd put me on one or he, I'd hold it while he'd get on one and then we'd turn loose and they'd see if we could ride them. Uh, we we was doing pretty good. We was riding about everything we we caught. Uh, so it was a Fourth of July in Brush, and uh, what year? Oh God, I don't remember. <laughs> it was before before the war. So, so you were probably in, in thirty nine or forty, and uh, so you so were ten. We, want, we wanted to go to Brush to the rodeo, right? And we figured we get. Brush, we'd get entered in that rodeo, mm -hmm. and uh, 
so we <laughs> we got the brush and we this uncle he went no we ain't gonna go we ain't gonna go and I said well I wanna go to the rodeo he said what are you gonna do at a rodeo and I said well I'm gonna ride the calves you can't ride no calves <laughs> was that Ernie or was that Buzz? No, it was Billy. Billy, oh, the oldest. Um, and uh, I said, yeah, I've been practicing a little here and there. And, uh, and we had a great big old roan heifer that was, so oh, she's probably as big as these calves I got out here now, but I wasn't very big when I was that age. Yeah. And he said, if you can ride her, we'll go to brush. And I rode her. <laughs> <laughs> Much to his surprise. Yeah, well, no, I knew I could ride her because I'd rode, I'd I rode mean, her a time or two Billy's before. Surprised. Oh, Billy was Billy surprised. Yeah, so then he said, oh, all right, we'll go to brush. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it was on a Friday, fourth was, and we always went to town on Saturday anyway. So then we we went to brush. And Kelly, they had, uh, what was it? They had the wild cow riding, but I don't know why they wouldn't let him in it. For some reason they wouldn't let him in. I don't know whether Grandma was still alive, and she threw the shit pit, I think. <laughs> and she wouldn't let him. Wouldn't she thought that? Was, and yeah. he was her baby. He was the youngest. Youngest boy. Yeah. And the, my he uncle was seventeen used, or eighteen used by to, then, though. On weekends, Sundays, while all the neighbors would bring horses and whatever over to their place, and they had a buck and shoot and everything. Right. And they'd put on little buck and contest just for fun you know and oh she was if she thought Kelly was gonna ride something down mm -hmm. there she would come down and wipe them out you right. know? <laughs> Clean out. but but Kelly he'd, he'd sneak on one every once in a while down there and he could ride pretty good but I think she put the kibosh to it she found out about it or something but I got in the calf riding and and uh, I was the only one that uh, rode long enough for the newspaper to get a picture. <laughs> really? Wow. And I wrote him on out after they got the picture. Uh, and then uh, they hollered, get off, so I got off. And, but it was it was something else. Did, then, you, did you win anything? Yeah, did you win? Oh, I forget what they, I think we, I think they paid us a dollar a piece to ride them, you know, to get on them. Right. The, and I think I got two dollars because I rode it, rode it till they said get off. <laughs> and then Dad, he was clowning some around at the uh, rodeos oh, then, yeah. and and uh, so he decided that I could I could ride them calves, so I'd go with him, and then I'd get in the calf riding. Mm -hmm. And uh, it always paid fifty cents or a dollar or something, you know. I forget what it was, but, mm -hmm. but I'd ride them calves. And we had a, a little mule, a little bitty mule. She was only, well, she was less than 50 inches tall. Right. Uh, we put her in the Shetland Pony Race. Uh, <laughs> she was <would> run <laughs> about all them Shetland Ponies. Well, it, it paid. It, I think they was paying $10 or 15 or something like that to win them Pony Races. Yeah. And boy, them guys was throw a fit. I was going to say, know. wouldn't it? Sort of unfair competition? No, because her mother was a, a Shetland pony, mm. and her dad was just a little old Spanish Jack. Right. But uh, they, when you know, when we <laughs> first started entering her in the, in the Shetland pony races, they thought that was funny. Whoa, that you know, that's, yeah. Uh, 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 yeah, let him in. Yeah, let him in. You know? <laughs> and damn, she'd jump up and run, run them all. Then they'd get mad, <laughs> right. and they wouldn't want her to get enter into it because she was. She was a mule of Shetland right. Pony, and right. she was half Shetland Pony, and some of them was running against were only half Shetland Pony. Right. They was half horse, you know, so <laughs> uh, but we used to have a lot of fun going out to rodeos with her. How long was it, how long before they uh, could before you couldn't enter her anymore? How many races do you think she well, ran? Well, we we uh, went to most of them because they'd be in, in different towns, but there was right around Brush and, and Fort Morgan mm -hmm. and Hillrose, why they, they'd let us do it at Brush, but mm -hmm. Hillrose and Fort Morgan, they said no, right. after we'd won the, <laughs> the first year. And we did that for about two or three years of that little mule. <laughs> we even took her one time clear up to Steamboat Springs. Oh, wow. uh, Dad was clowning up there, 
and we took her up there and, and uh, won the pony race with her there. And everybody was mad, but we didn't care. We were never coming back. Yeah. <laughs> you know? it, it was kind of fun to do things like that. And the so, night before the rodeo, why the sheriff of the town took me and we went in and we're restaurant with this mule. I'd ride her into the restaurants and into the bars and into the grocery stores. And really? He was advertising the rodeo, see. Oh. And uh, he, we went to every place in that downtown with that mule. And he's, he was about half drunk. He'd right. go here and go there and we all over. So you just you put your hat out for no, contributions? No, I, never, I don't think I got a dime for going there. Well, I got I got some ice cream at the drugstore. And what else did I get? I got something <coughs> sandwich at one of the restaurants or something, but it was they didn't pay anything. So would you stay in a hotel when you went to do these things? Huh? Where would you stay? Would well, you we sleep out on the ground. Oh. We just take our stars. bed rolls. Yeah. And uh, at the rodeo grounds. Or? Yeah. Yeah. This one guy that we kind of always went with. Well, we just going and he. He had he took horses mm -hmm. and we throw this mule in mm -hmm. and when we get there we just uh, throw a lot of bedroll out on the ground just blankets you know lay down mm -hmm. and if it was raining well, he'd stretch a tarp down from the trailer <laughs> to where we wouldn't get wet. But it was warm enough. Usually. Oh yeah, it was summertime all the yeah. time. They didn't really go in the wintertime back there. Right. It was all summer. Ground is hard though, summer or winter. Uh, uh, and Dale, my older sister, got the tap dancing. And she could tap dance and beat hell when she's little. No kidding. And Cope would take her around to all the bars in town. And she'd tap dance and these drunks and throw her coins. Oh, God. And I'd get her all up. That's for sure. Gather them all up. No kidding. <laughs> And I think Cope took about half of them, as I recall. Mm -hmm. you know, she isn't happy tough. about that, though. Huh? It's one of the things she says she hated yeah. was going to those bars and tap dancing. Yeah. Well, she enjoyed it at the time. Yeah, I know, but looking back on it, she yeah. hated it, you know, she said. Yeah. One she, of the liked, things she liked to get that money just like anybody else. And but it was, it was degrading to her when she looked back on yeah. it. You know. She got older. And she got older, and she remembered yeah. she had to go do that. She thought it was mm -hmm. Then she didn't charity. like it. Yeah. And, you know, they're throwing money to her for charity. Kind of. Was it? Cleo. She yeah, always she hated. She danced. <laughs> Cleo always hated liver, because liver was real cheap meat mm -hmm. during the Depression. Right. And Mom would send Cleo down to the butcher shop shop for some liver. Forced to eat. And of course, this old guy, Charlie Swiker, he was a racehorse man when he wasn't in butcher shop. And, mm -hmm. and him and dad and the Smith boys, they were all friends, you know. So he'd shoot up one a pound or two pounds of liver, he'd give her five pounds. <laughs> For the price. Of yeah, you know. right. And uh, she kind of related that to poverty, right. you know. Right. Welfare for that old man or whatever. <laughs> and for years she wouldn't eat liver after she got years up old enough years. where if there was something else to eat, she wouldn't eat liver. <laughs> but then when she come out here, well, we, we had liver, of course, from our cows. And, and she fixed liver. And really? She and eat. enjoyed it, yeah. And really? she enjoyed it. It's, it's, I liked it and she liked it. <laughs> wow. Yuck. So she, Jeffrey <laughs> likes it. Yeah, well, that's okay. <laughs> I don't mind. So she kind of got past it. Huh? So she got past it. Yeah. So it was uh, it was Kelly and and three brothers. He had three brothers. He had, he had five brothers. Five Kelly, Billy, and Ernie. Well, I'm going from the bottom. You're going up. from the bottom up. Okay. Kelly and Ernie and Bus. Clyde, Bus, Bus. And Don, and Billy. Okay. Six of them. Okay. Six brothers and four and sisters. Four girls. There was. There was Edith. Edith, Florence, Florence Mom, Mom, and Sylvia. And Sylvia. And there was four girls. That was a big yeah. family. And it was a tough life because they didn't have any money either. Mm -hmm. 
they had their homesteads that they homesteaded from the government, right. and they proved them up and they got title to them. Mm -hmm. The them you couldn't raise enough on them, on them to, to. They were mostly just grass, grass country, and they tried to. Charlie tried to bust them up and do some farming, break the ground up and do some mm -hmm. farming with it, but it, it, it wasn't farming country. Right. You know, it was, it was farm country, but you couldn't get the moisture, you know, the water that it needed. Mm -hmm. Grandma's had a little creek on it, but they didn't have any way of getting the water out of the creek onto the fields to <coughs> grow. Mm -hmm. uh, and that one got sold. Yeah, well, gotten, got gotten given away for the $80. Yeah. The dust bowl came later. Yeah, that was in the thirties. So and this, yeah, and this was in well, in uh, the twenties when they saw homestead. Right. It, do, do any of those original homesteads still? No. I don't even know where they're at anymore. Kelly might know where Grandma's was. Oh. But, we uh, went out. No, to nobody owns any of that land. Anymore. No, no, no. We went out to the one place where the windmill was. Though. Well, the old general place, but yeah. they just rented that. The boys just rented that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's where you went with all the brothers, yeah. and they were so ornery to him and had him doing them. Take his boots and put them on the roof until he washed the dishes. I was half wash the dishes yeah. and sweep the floor and everything. <laughs> Wouldn't let him have his boots. <laughs> then you didn't go out on that hot sand without his shoes on. Right. <laughs> So you guys were all living together in the same area, basically? In the same house. Oh, oh everybody. Was, everybody. Well, there was Bus and Ernie and Billy and Kelly and I mm -hmm. lived there in the summer. In the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, Kelly first. Again, uh, working, right? Just Well, they were they were farming and, mm -hmm. and breaking taking. Breaking horses. Breaking horses. Anything to make some money. Right. They, they'd travel. They'd leave early in the spring and they'd make get on their horses and make big circles all around the country and gather up horses to break. Mm -hmm. And they'd brand they work horses, saddle horses, anything that you wanted broke, they could do it. Right. And they had a reputation of doing it. And uh, so they'd bring them over there mm -hmm. and then they'd use them to farm with and they'd use them to take care of the cattle and they the cattle they had some cattle of their own but then they People would bring cattle in and they'd lease them, you know, right. they'd rent it, their pasture cattle and, and they'd pay them to run them all summer. Mm -hmm. And that's the way, you know, and the, they were. In, in the fall of the year, they'd go back out with these horses and distribute them around and collect the money. I think, I think they would get $10 a piece for breaking them all summer. And who got but to ride were. a lot of them? Well, I got to ride some. Yeah, the hard ones. No, Ernie and Ernie, <laughs> the one that could ride the tough ones was Bus. He could ride a bucking horse. And Ernie, he he thought he was as good as Bus, but he wasn't. <laughs> and Kelly, after they they'd get him going pretty good, why he'd ride him for a while, and then I'd get to ride him. Mm -hmm. And then when Ernie and Bus left, I just left Kelly and me and Billy out there, and Billy had some draft horses. You know the workhorses, mm -hmm. and it was my job to break them colts when they was two year old. I had to break them to ride, just get up on them so they could turn them and stop them. Mm -hmm. And then the next year, when they put them in a harness to work them, it wasn't. It was easy. All I had to do was just put them in a harness and hook them up, and they'd drive. You right. know? But I broke broke them horses. Kelly still tells about the time one of the neighbors when when Billy. Uh, he'd give these horses to the neighbors when he quit farming. Mm -hmm. And the neighbors was telling Kelly one day, huh, we broke that Ted horse to ride. Yeah, we broke him to ride. We, yeah, we, we broke him to ride. Kelly said, you're full of shit. He said, Doc, my nephew, 11, 12 years old, broke him to ride. <laughs> but he still tells about that. Minkies talking about how they broke them horses to ride. Hmm. He said, I knew they didn't. He says, you was the one that broke them colts. <laughs> but you were also like the young, gullible uh, nephew that they picked yeah. on, didn't they? They picked on him, yeah. big time. They, well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tell the truth. <laughs> yeah. Well. 
That's Any it. dirty job they had to do, they gave it to Doc. Yeah, well, yeah. well that wasn't too bad, <laughs> you know. But I was the only nephew they'd let come out and stay with them. And, you know, even some of the other nephews would have given her anything. Like to Tracy? And no, not Tracy, Tracy wasn't born. But no. But Don's boy, Donald, mm. Buddy. Buddy, he wasn't very old, but he would have loved to stay out there with the boys. And uh, they, would, they would never let them. <laughs> uh, well, they let Raymond Hay or Jack Haley come for about a week one summer, and they was glad to get rid of him. <laughs> he was, well, he was he wouldn't do anything, you know. Mm -hmm. They'd ask me to do something, I'd try my damnest to do it for him. Right. You know, didn't make any difference what it was. And, uh, when they was thrashing grain, well, I'd get up in the wagon and, and keep a grain pushed away from the feeder when it come into the wagon. Ooh. And it was yeah. a dirty, nasty. nasty son of a bitch and job. But, you know, I'd do it. Mm -hmm. And it was a let a man go do something else. Yeah. Know, they didn't have to hire anybody that way. Yeah. But it, it, was, it was a good life for, what, you know, them days. Right. Mm. And then when Kelly would come, well, he only, see, I was, he was, uh, he was behind in school. He, he didn't start, he didn't like school. He's like me, didn't like school. Right. But he'd start and then uh, his mother, he'd cry and belly ache and so she wouldn't let him make him go that year. And he missed about two years right in the first two years of school. And then she finally decided that he had to go to school. So she started making him go and, uh, and then, but before he got to the eighth grade, he quit all together. He yeah. just told him to hell and he went, you know. Forget about and it. And he yeah. went out there and stayed with Billy and, and them, Ernie and Bus. And he done some of the work, but not very much. He, he wasn't very work worker. He would mm -hmm. go over and, and work for the neighbors during hay season or thrashing season. And he'd go and work for the neighbors, and Billy tell how he'd go over there and be a hell of a hand over there, and he wouldn't do nothing at home. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the kind of the way he was. Wow. That's the way typically a lot of kids are. They'll do a lot more for somebody else. Oh, yeah. Then they go yeah, home. But it's just nature. That's very true. It's yeah. nature. Uh, cool. You're getting off the beaten path here, kiddo. Oh, that's all right. I say we're getting off the beaten we're just, path here. We're just going all over. <laughs> that wow. was when I was growing up back there. And then when we got married, then we stayed there. Well, I guess we got part of that when we, when mm -hmm. we came to California. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. When, uh, I, I've heard the, the deer, get, when you, when you oh, hit the deer, that. but when, when and where was that? I forget about it. Well, that was after Dana was. She oh. was six months yeah. old. She was six months old. We, we it came was out here. Cortez, and, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And we worked at Red Mix Companies. And you told him that. Yeah. And, uh, well, okay. Uh, yeah, we, I think yesterday we left off, right? When you had moved into the, uh, the motel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. We, we brought that old sorrel horse with us. And, yeah. And the guy behind us, uh, he wanted a rope, so we built an arena at his place. Mm -hmm. And we roped over there. I uh, went to a few rodeos, not many, because we didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, I couldn't take the grossing money and go rodeo like a lot of the guys did. Uh, they don't, you know, they, they, they didn't make any money rodeoing. Right. Some of them thought they were making money, but I've got a hell of a lot more now than they ever will have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I just couldn't take the grocery money or the rent money or whatever and go rodeo with it. We had an extra twenty dollars when we buy wood once in a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, but rodeo rodeo entries weren't as expensive then no, either. Well, it was twenty twenty five dollars. Right. That was a lot, and though. That was a lot of money at that time. To just you know. And I didn't make a lot of money, but I made a little. You know, mm -hmm. and the last year I rodeoed around here was I went to five rodeos by one. Two, one second, and 
concern, and I missed the cat. <laughs> and that year we figured up how much money I'd made and taking the entry fees out, right. not counting the gas and so forth, I made five hundred dollars. <laughs> so we didn't I didn't feel it was worth it. We didn't think it was a very good Our idea. Is a career, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we didn't rodeo any after that. Wow. Oh, Five hundred bucks. Well, we, we had the little, on. yeah, we had the little oh, arena group. up here on the hill in those years up on First Street. Yeah, they had That's a little. That's where the monkey, she, your mom oh, yeah. thought she bit her toe, but he didn't right. really bite it. He was playing with her. Right. He was threatening to bite it, but he didn't really bite it. Scared her to. Pieces. Yeah, we well we rodeoed up there, but, right there. but I just you know that was just for fun. It was just yeah. jackpot mostly. Yeah, and I enjoyed the jackpot started going to team roping jackpots and never did make much money doing that either. No, but it was fun. Yeah. So obviously the weather was different, but what what did you find was different about California compared to Colorado? Was the weather the, the biggest one there? people different or the... Well, I don't know, because most people in California, more then than now, were from somewhere else. Yeah. They were from Colorado, or they were from Arizona, or they were from, you know, Texas, New Mexico, or other places. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were kind of the same kind of people that we were, yeah. were kind of grew up on right. ranches and farms. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's like... Uh, Hell was that football player that uh, was a great football player and and he rodeoed too hmm. off season while he'd rodeoed and they asked him one time about which he liked best and he said well he liked the rodeo the best because he said when you're rodeoing you're with people you are alike you your background's the same you have the same interests you know. Mm -hmm. He says, you football, and there might be one guy there that was a farmer somewhere, or the rest of them are all city boys, you know. And right. he said, that's the, the difference between, that's why he liked it and didn't like it. But mainly it was because in California you could get a job. Well, if you wanted to work, there was always a job somewhere. And uh, you could get a job for an, if, if you wanted to work. A lot of guys would work enough to get their unemployment built up, right. and then whenever the job run out or whatever they were doing, they get fired or whatever. Then they'd draw their unemployment till it run out, and then they'd have to give them another job. But they right. could always get a job if they wanted to work. Right. You still can in California. Yeah. You know, even what they call the depression, the hard luck coming, the recession times. Mm -hmm. If a guy wants to work, he don't care what he does. He can work. He dug so, ditches. He did everything imaginable. Yeah. So you started uh, when you got here in '55, right? Yeah. To at Ready Mix. No, I first worked or, with her with dad, dad first. We were. Uh, uh, he was painting houses, and I wasn't much of a house painter, but I could put paint on the wall, and then he'd come behind me and clean Fix it up, it. you know. <laughs> and I'd paint the eaves, you know, and mm -hmm. and we. Um, that's the way we. We made our money for the first probably six months. Probably yeah. six months or so. Yeah, and then we, uh, we oh, he had that little digging machine mm -hmm. too. The small one. Yeah, he had a little digging machine, and Sheena Ready Mix was building a Ready Mix plant over mm -hmm. there, and he went over there to do some ditch work for him. And this guy was asking him if he knew anybody that was for would work, you know, and. and was looking for work, and he told me I had a guy that would. He didn't tell him it's his son-in-law. Mm -hmm. He and I went over there, and and they were working there and doing something, and and I uh, they were cleaning out the ditches, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so I was talking to him, and I grabbed the shovel and started helping him clean the ditches out. Just in conversation. You know, I'm talking while we was, and, and so he told me come work the next day, and I. Went to work over there and stayed there till he one guy run him out of, out of business. He yeah. spent all the money, mm -hmm. never did pay the bills, and they went bankrupt. Oh, wow. But then I went to work for Holiday. You work for Crown? Well, no, I went for Holiday Rock for mm -hmm. uh, worked for Holiday for a while, and then I worked for Standard. Mm -hmm. 
and then they had a little ready mix plant down here in Corona, Crown ready mix, and I, I basically ran that for the guy while he was off spending the money, <laughs> and he went bankrupt. And we almost, two of us, well the secretary and another guy that was working there and I, we went to all the creditors and asked him what was the possibility of us taking it over. Would they uh, go along with us, let us have six months or a year right. to bring the business back up and start paying, paying them the money that, that was owed them and we'd have a job and everything, and, but they decided it was just too much money. We wouldn't be able to pay it off in time, so they confiscated everything. Mm -hmm. and then I went back to work for Pomona, didn't I? I think so. And worked for Pomona until the longest then. Till I quit and went over to another ready mix. Huh? It was Pomona another ready mix. Was yeah, Pomona okay. ready mix. Then when Dana was little. Well, Dana. Dana was, we still working for Pomona when Dana was born. Mm -hmm. But she was little, wasn't she? About 12 or 14 months old when you went Yeah, to when we went to work. The district? At the district. Mosquito Bay. She, well, she was born in. December. She was, she was a year and a half old. Mm -hmm. I went to work over there in August. And she was born the December before. Hmm. How did you make the jump from ready mix to the mosquito abatement? Uh. With a lot of difficulty. Well, there was a, <laughs> a guy that we Different knew, world. we got acquainted with, yeah. he had mules. Mm -hmm. And he'd come to these ropings and he'd, he'd sit and we'd get, we got acquainted talking at these ropings and so forth. And so one day I was digging a ditch with her dad's machine up on Hamner and uh, he uh, stopped by there. And he said, how'd you like to go to work for me? He was manager of the Mosquito Abatement District. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't know, what do you pay? And he told me what he'd pay and all the benefits and so forth. And wasn't many at that time. They had Kaiser, but, though. No, they didn't have Kaiser. They, <laughs> didn't they? We had, we had Blue Cross then. Oh, they didn't have so. any insurance mm -hmm. that way. Maybe you're right. But uh, I went to work over there, and the day, the day I went to work for him, all of his employees, went to the board, told them what an asshole he was and how he was doing this and he was doing that and he was, you know. And so the next morning, he fired them all, all but me. Wow. Uh, so they, they were out of job. And then they had a big hearing. The board had a big hearing about it. Right. And so they fiddled around for, it was, well, all of August all of September and starting into November before they finally fired him. What year? And he that was in 66? Okay. 65. Was it 65 or 66? Okay. 65. No, it was in... 66? No, Dana was just uh, six months old. Yeah. Yeah. Really? yeah. Mm -hmm. That was 65. Okay. But, uh, and while he and I was the only two there. We was controlling the mosquitoes, you know, wow. and he was showing me what to do and where to go and what, you know, and everything. And then I started picking it up. And and uh, when they fired him, I was the only one left. Yeah. There wasn't and anybody a, there. Holy cow. And it was, <laughs> it was winter girl. time, and he told me, he had explained to me all the things that, that they did in the winter time, like they took all the trucks tore them all apart, put right. new brakes on them, if they right. needed clutches, whatever, you know. Right. And so I started doing that. Um, he told me to, to do it before he left. He said, you just, he says, you hang on here, because don't, you, he said, you start doing the things that I've told you that we do. Mm -hmm. And he said, you'll have a good job here. Mm -hmm. And so I had trucks, and I'd take the brakes off, put on new brakes, put it Clutch in one of them, I had them, you know. Worked on the blowers. Yeah, I worked on, I had some blowers that we worked on. And, that would spread and, the uh, pesticide? Spread the pesticide along mm -hmm. the banks of the and, Well, Bob Shogren channels. was the entomologist, but he was just a part-time entomologist. Mm -hmm. And he'd come by, oh, maybe twice a week 
to do the animology work. And uh, I'd be out there in the shop working. Right. And he'd come in and, and uh, do his animology work, and he'd come out and talk to him. And we got acquainted and became pretty good friends. Mm -hmm. And then they hired him as manager. And I stayed on as field supervisor is what he, what I'd hired on at. Right. And we stayed there till he left and went to Bakersfield. You went to Bakersfield. But you stayed. I stayed. Mm -hmm. You retired when Jeffrey was just a couple weeks old. Yeah. And then uh, they hired a manager, and he was there about a year, and he died, and then I was the part-time interim manager, they called it, right. uh, for six months till they hired another guy. They asked, and, asked him to apply and be manager, but it was... Well, the apply. first time I applied... He didn't want all the book work but, and all the budgets and all I'm the not, stuff. I'm not much of a book worker. <laughs> He's a do-it-yourself guy. I told him that I, don't, I didn't really want to, and they said, you apply. And two of, them, two of the board members said, you apply. We want you to apply. So I figured mm -hmm. that's a pretty good end. Right. There was five board members. <laughs> uh, didn't quite have anyway, well, he didn't have any guy. degrees. He didn't, you know, he didn't have any degrees of any kind. No. And and managers usually have a a BA or an AA or something, you know. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the. Well, they they had several years experience. Yeah. And yes. I only I only had uh, well I had about four years with children. By then, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the. The man they hired, he, he died, and um, they wanted me to apply, so I applied, and they didn't give it to me. They hired a another turkey. <laughs> uh, so I stayed. You know? um, we ate him for dinner, <laughs> the turkey. <laughs> was that Luna? Was it Luna? It was... Uh, no, no, it, it was, was Whitworth. Whitworth, yeah. He was a strange guy. Uh, he was doing the same thing that they fired Jim Lane for. Oh, mm -hmm. that's right, I remember. And he would take a district vehicle and run all over hell in it and do take personal the employees business and to take his kids to drive in show in it, or, you, know, you know. Yeah. And I told him one day, County I said, employees, hey, you don't do that I said, it ain't, it ain't any my business. And I said, I don't want you to think that I'm trying to tell you what to do, but I said, you're doing just exactly what Jim Lane got fired for. He was using district right. vehicles, using district employees. He would he would have Luna, the animologist at that time, he would have him go over and pick his kids up from school <laughs> because they were they were sick. And <laughs> take them to his house, drop them off, and then <laughs> uh, maybe two days later why well, he'd have him go pick one up and take it to the doctor. Wow. You know, and so forth. And he was doing a bunch of stuff like that. <laughs> and then when I told him that it wasn't any of my business, but you better be careful, then he got down on me and he was going to get rid of me because <laughs> I was going to interfere with his plaything. Well, it wound up he was the one that they got rid of. Hmm. They fired him. Wow. And uh, then they, well, when they fired him, they put me in as manager again for again. six months. Right. And uh, then they hired Luna, the Mexican mm -hmm. that uh, was, he was a pretty good animologist and we got along real well mm -hmm. when we were equal. Right. You know, in fact, he'd come over here and we'd have dinner and we'd do different things, you know, together. And, and uh, we went to the Norco Fair together and, you know, we were just basically friends. Mm -hmm. And so they they wanted, and one of the board members asked me to apply again, and I told him, no, I didn't want to, because I knew Luna was going to apply, mm -hmm. and I figured he would be a better, because he had a, a bachelor's degree, mm -hmm. and uh, I figured he would be better for the job, so I told him, no, and I didn't really want it anyway, mm -hmm. I told him no, so they hired him. And about a month went by, and then his little 
He was the boss. He was yeah, the I important mean, he person. He was the boss. He didn't want you to do anything that he didn't tell you to do. Right. And I anything. went along with him for a long, long time like that. Yeah. And I told him one day, he was raising hell about something, and I said, Loma, let me tell you something. You tell me to do something. Anything you want me to do, I'll do it. But I'm not going to do anything unless you tell me. Mm-hmm. Because that's, that's what he wanted. Mm -hmm. That's what he wanted, but then he didn't know what to do with it when he got mm -hmm. it. Right. So then he said, well, you, you go ahead, you're, you're on the field. <laughs> so I, me and the guys, would, we took care of, we killed the mosquitoes, mm -hmm. and we did our jobs. Right. We, we worked around him and, yeah. you know, anything, right. you know, <laughs> and we, if some, we had a problem in the field, we never would take it to him. Yeah. They'd come to me and we'd, you know, we'd decide, all right, what's the problem? And um, basically we'd all work together and, well, your dad was there. Mm -hmm. uh, we would work together and get it solved and he'd never know there was a problem. Yeah. Until he got to be so obnoxious and then I, we tried to get him fired. The whole crew tried to get him fired. Mm -hmm. The whole crew? And, and they didn't get the fired. The entomologist. Uh, he wouldn't go along. Major Dillon? Yeah. Was he the animal yeah. then? Yeah. And he wouldn't go along with it. Well, he had a, a master's degree working on his PhD. Yeah. And he wouldn't go along with it, so the board uh, figured we was just a bunch of disgruntled employees. Right. So I had been there long enough, and I was at the right age, so I retired. And six months later, when he couldn't go out in the field, he couldn't get the problem solved right. that I'd been, me and the guys had been solving. Because right. uh, the guys got to where, when the residents would call and say, uh, hey, what about so and so? You know, they'd go out and they'd talk to them and they'd start telling them, why don't you guys this one? They'd say, why don't you call a manager? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Oops. they'd call a manager. Well, I took it off of their back, put it on his back. He didn't know what he to do. He didn't know with. what to do. Yeah. He didn't know what to do with it. Hmm. He liked to go to meetings, go down to the city hall. Uh, I'm the manager. Talk to the yeah. County, <laughs> ma county, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, he loved that. But right. so far as doing what we do out here to kill mosquitoes, no he clue. didn't have a clue. Uh -huh. And so six months later, they fired him. Hmm. And then Major Dillon, they put him in. Yeah. Uh, that's all. The saga of the mosquitoes. In the meantime, you're starting the daycare when? I started the daycare when Dana was little. She was about, she was less than two. Uh-huh. Because we had big brother, big sister, two grandmas, and a mama and a papa, and no kids. So I wanted somebody to be here to play with her. Really? And that's Dana, the whole was the total reason that she I started the daycare. Two, two kids. Had two little kids. Their name was their last names were French. I don't even remember their first names. Hmm. French. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got two dollars and a half a week. Wow. For two kids. <laughs> wow. Were they teachers? No, kids just kids. In those days? Yeah. Just no. It took me. It them. took me a few years to get teachers' kids. Yeah. Because be, until I had. A teacher's job. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that scope was out there. Yeah, that whole because I worked whole from market. Seven, I worked from four, six five. in the morning to six at night. Right. And when I had teachers' kids, I opened at seven. Right. And I closed at four thirty-five was the latest. Right. And as the well, most of the time it was as the years went on, it was three thirty or four. Really. Because that's when school's over. Right. And that was good. <laughs> I liked that a lot. But by the time I finished, I was taking care of 12. 12 a year? Or 12 just 12 a day. A, 12 a day. I mean, yeah. yeah, 12 kids a day. 12 kids. And most of them were from six weeks mm -hmm. to four. Because you know, yeah. yeah, when they turned five, school. they went to kindergarten right. for half a day. Right. And then they'd come back then over they'd here. Come back. And there was times you had more than the 12 when the kids had come back. Yeah, I could overlap. I was allowed on my license, you know, uh, it was 
limit of 12. They said no more than 12 in the house at any one time. Mm -hmm. So as some of the kids would leave and they would come back, mm -hmm. if they overlapped an hour or two, I didn't worry about it. Yeah. But for the most part, I stayed well within my license limits. How many kids do you think went through here? Mm -hmm. You know, I'd like to add that up some year. <laughs> <laughs> but I had mothers that had three and four children with me. So as one would go, I would get another one. Mm -hmm. I had Becky and Robin each had two. Bars had three. Um, Grant Beckland, they had two, but then they adopted two. Mm -hmm. And I mean, just down the line, that yeah. Debbie Adams, mm -hmm. uh, mother and dad, well, yeah, I only had one the one for her. Right. But the teachers, and a lot of them are still in the district, like the, um, the uh, Paula Lascano. Mm -hmm. Remember her from our retirement party? Sure. Yeah, she's Hawaiian. She had two. And she had two, and at our Marissa at our, and Marissa and Artie. Right. And at our retirement party, he was 31 at the time, mm -hmm. and I had taken care of him when he was four or five. Well, he, until he was four or five, but I took care yeah. of him when he was little, hmm. little. You know, six months maybe. Yeah. But in the years, early years, I had Jerry Plummer from across, they lived over here. I had Alan and a friend of hers, and I got that baby at two days. Oh, two days old. Two days. two days old. She was going back, she to work, to back to work? She had to go back to work. And wow. that was in the that years, was. that's when Dana was little. So it was 64, 65, you know. Wow. And you didn't have maternity leaves right. and when you were off work you were off work yeah. and she worked at the naval ordnance lab wow. but i bathed that little kimberly was her name and i'd bathe her in the kitchen sink she was the tiniest little thing mm -hmm. uh, and she had a, i don't know she <laughs> finally grew into her mouth <laughs> she had the biggest mouth for such a tiny little face <laughs> And it was always open. And it was I'm always grinning. It, it was always <laughs> Just too cute. She grew out of it, though. Yeah. But she's, <laughs> but she's what, proud and 40? Oh, I would say oh, at then. least Dana's 38. Wow. Well, she, she was younger than that, so she's 35 she now. Um, but it was fun. Those old kids were just, just absolutely special. Mm -hmm. And the first time that Mary Knox, you know Mary Knox, the mm -hmm. black lady? Oh, yeah. yeah. Mary Knox came <coughs> to interview me mm -hmm. for daycare. No, she talked to you on the phone. Yeah, but the first time she came here to interview oh. me, she brought both sets of grandparents. Right. Remember that? Yeah. And her mother, oh. her, her, she and her husband, and somebody else, the grandmother, the great-grandmother. I don't know. There was about six of them. And, in here. and you're blinking. Is that supposed to blink? Uh, I've got a couple minutes. Oh, okay. Almost. Anyway, they came in and we visited, and, and I, I had no problem with a little black girl, or a black family for that matter. But I said, the only thing I'm concerned with, and I don't think it'll be a problem, but our daughter has never seen a black child. Dana had never seen a black child. We didn't have any black people in Norco. Mm -hmm. well. And this little Karen was little bitty, just typical little pickaninny type mm -hmm. black child. The little braids, you know, and just cute as a bug. And I didn't know if Dana would say, why is she black mm -hmm. or, you, you don't know. Right. They walked in together and Dana was tow-headed, blonde, and Karen was the darkest little thing you ever saw, and it was just like they met their soulmates. They never even blinked. Mm -hmm. Off they went, mm -hmm. you know, and that was the way it always was. Mm -hmm. And we used to, in those years, we didn't have that many children. And so we would take them to the grocery store or wherever, especially Karen. And this one over here, smart thing as he is, He'd take them in the basket, and I'd go some around a different aisle to get something else, and he'd say, Now you call her, call Mama Carol, big fat Mama Carol, and they hear these kids <laughs> echoing through this store. <laughs>
People uh, turn on and look at that kid and look at us. Yeah, because Karen called me Mama Carol. Uh, yeah. She, were, just like Dana did. She called me Mama and, and Karen called me Mama Carol. That's great. Uh, <laughs> put Mert's house in out here. I was laying a slab for it. Mm. And there was a kid that used to come over and want a rope. And he went in the Marine Corps. And when he came back, he went to, was gone to Vietnam for a while. And he came back. Well, we sat out there, and I was finishing that concrete, and I didn't have time to stop and talk to him. I was going to try to talk to him while I was finishing that concrete. And uh, pretty quick, he says, uh, well, Carol was bringing kids out of the play yard, you know. Mm -hmm. He says, uh, hey, you had any more kids lately? And she had this little Karen by the hand, and I said, yeah, one. And I was a little suspicious when she got <laughs> <laughs> That kid didn't know what the hell to say. say. He thought it was true. <laughs> She was yeah, no, no, no. Hey, right there. <laughs> <laughs> and I had one ahead working. Pretty quick, I couldn't stand it. I had to laugh. <laughs> he said, God damn you, I thought you were serious. <laughs> <laughs> but we'd, we'd take her with us, and she calls Mama Carol and Daddy, Daddy Doc. When did she first start coming? Like, when, when did she first come here? Dana was two, right? She, so was Dana was a little less than two, year and a half 60, or so, and Karen was just a tiny bit younger than Dana. So 60... 65, 66, probably 66. Right, right in the middle then of the... Of all the mess. Civil rights oh, yeah. movement. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But, it, you know, I mean, we never had any problem with uh, yeah. other races, ever, you mm -hmm. know. And... Uh, I can just see the, the time that it was. Yeah, and, uh. and you don't, you know, out of the mouths of babes, as they say, comes whatever. Mm -hmm. And I was just afraid that something Dana would say or sure. ask would offend.